Hi there! When I started as an 18-year-old student in the Aerospace Engineering program at the University of Rome, I was fascinated by questions related to the design of aerospace systems and the why of things. For example, why would your commercial aircraft always have the shape of a wing and tube, and why they all kind of look the same, regardless of the manufacturer? I asked myself the same questions over and over when I got acquainted with spacecraft in university. Why would satellites make use of two solar arrays instead of having just one? And why not three? <laughs> and why do they have the shape they have? You find similar why questions in other segments of the space industry, of course. For example, why launch vehicles have the shape they have? Why did the space shuttle use 2.5 stages to bring 25 metric tons to LEO, while a small launcher like Vega in Europe has four stages to bring between 1 to 1.5 metric tons in orbit? You can ask why questions for all the design decisions that have been taken in all types of space systems. I've always been seeking answers for the why engineers have taken certain design decisions at the early stages of the project life cycle. These were the type of questions that obsessed me as an aerospace engineering student, and a few years down the road as an engineer and professor in this field. To make a long story short, I was really fascinated by the engineering rationale behind system design and product development. And that is how, cultivating those questions during my five years of studies, I ended up working on a master thesis in systems engineering at the University of Rome La Sapienza in my home country, Italy, and later on on a related PhD degree at MIT in the United States. Back when I was a student in Rome, my thesis supervisor gave me the opportunity to do research experience at the concurrent design facility of the European Space Agency in the Netherlands as part of my thesis project. At ESA, I got introduced to the problem of mission formulation and to the concurrent design methodology that back in the days was just about getting traction in industry. The agency had just introduced a few years back concurrent engineering as a methodology for conceptual design of a space mission. Concurrent design is a topic that we'll be exploring now with a special emphasis on the relevance to the new space industry. This discussion will be broken down into a sequence of videos because I would like to give it appropriate space given its relevance to the new space community. In this first video on the subject, I'm going to give a broad overview of concurrent conceptual design practice. I will describe traditional design approaches, also known as over-defense and waterfall design processes, among other names. In the next video, after this one, I will compare this traditional uh, design approach to the concurrent design approach, discussing advantages and weaknesses of each design practice. I will then discuss the relevance of concurrent conceptual design to the new space industry sectors in terms of opportunities for new space, both as a customer of this technology and as potentially innovators and product developers in this field. So, let us get started. I want to draw your attention to the words I'm using very carefully. In this video, I'm talking about concurrent conceptual design, which is a subdiscipline of concurrent engineering. Concurrent engineering is a broad set of methodology that foresee the parallelization of work in an engineering activity. There are plenty of definitions out there in the scientific literature. I will point out some useful papers in the description below. Our working definition in this video is the one that has been proposed by Winner et others in 1988, which defines concurrent engineers as a systematic approach to the integrated concurrent design of products and their related processes, including manufacturing and support. This approach is intended to cause the developers from the very outset to consider all the elements of the product life cycle, from conception to disposal, including quality, cost, schedule, and user requirements. Dr. Dominic Knoll has recently analyzed the definition of concurrent conceptual design in the frame of his PhD thesis at Skoltech. In his dissertation, he says, the term concurrent in this context actually means two things. One, a team working on different aspects of a conceptual design in parallel, and two, in the same place, collocation. Concurrent conceptual design is then a conceptual design activity with elements of concurrency in its implementation in terms of parallelization of the activities and collocation of the design team. The references with these definitions are reported in the description of this video again below. Concurrent engineering is not exactly new as an idea. It has been around for more than 30 years. Many of these big ideas in technology that are hyped nowadays, if you think about it, 
or born in the 1980s, such as artificial intelligence, for example. Concurrent engineering is one of those ideas from the 80s. Why concurrent engineering became truly very popular only later, in the 1990s, and even more, in the last two decades? I do not have a definite answer to this, but it probably relies on the fact that nowadays we fully rely on computers for designing engineering products. We experience an exponential advance in computing which allows us to share more seamlessly and in a faster way between our working applications. Concurrent engineering includes concurrent conceptual design, but it goes far well beyond. We must be careful then not to confuse concurrent engineering with concurrent conceptual design. Concurrent engineering can be applied, for example, to later stages of the life cycle, such as in detail design, verification and validation, assembly integration and testing, and so on. It can also be applied to the design of the industrial systems that support production activities. This is the case, for instance, of the use of concurrent engineering in the design of final assembly lines or FALs of aircraft. I will explain in the video next to this one why this activity is an important opportunity for new space startups and why new space should draw particular attention to this topic. What I'm going to do now is that I will set the stage for this discussion to happen. Two of the areas of discussion nowadays in industry are Industry 4.0 and Digitalization. Digital engineering is seen as the key to reduce product design life cycles even by a half. For example, while a complex product such as an aircraft system is typically designed in about 10 years. Today, we want to shrink this time to half, five years, in order to remain on top of a highly competitive market. In the space domain, we want to move at conceiving, designing, and launching missions from, say, two to three years in the fast track cases to 12 months at most. This goal can be achieved by several means, for example, by standardization. And among those means for reducing development time and therefore cost, we find concurrent conceptual design. In concurrent conceptual design, multidisciplinary teams of engineers are tasked to assess the technical and cost feasibility of mission concepts. The concurrent design methodology is very simple in essence. First, we will talk about the traditional over-defense design approach or waterfall development process. Then, we will compare this traditional approach to concurrent conceptual design and draw conclusions from the comparison. Traditional engineering design practice is dubbed over-defense to signify the compartmentalization of working departments who would literally build fences around them and send over one data package from one compartment to the other, jumping the fence. A pure over-defense waterfall design process is sequential, linear, and it's very logical on paper. First, engineers formulate the system requirements that define what the system shall do in order to fulfill the overall mission objectives. Requirements are prescribed and then cascaded at each level of the system hierarchy as mission, system, subsystem, and component requirements. The formulation of requirements results in the breakdown of a space mission concept into its constituent disciplines, such as orbit, payload, structure, thermal, attitude determination and control, propulsion, communications, avionics, power, and so on. In traditional engineering organizations, every discipline is associated to a specific department. Once requirements are cascaded to individual disciplines, they are used as the basis of design work for each aspect of the mission. Design activity is carried in isolated compartments and integrated through face-to-face -face meetings. So in principle, one would start from mission requirements, distribute requirements to all domain experts involved, let them do their job, then integrate all analysis together and iterate as needed. This structure process would work very well, except that in reality, it never works this way. The design process needs to be iterated over and over. Iterations are inevitable, but they are expensive because they require time and therefore money. In waterfall design processes at a regular pace, iterations in a preliminary design study for a typical space mission may lead to convergence only in six to nine months of work. Why are iterations required? Why would the design not work on the first attempt if requirements were properly prescribed from the beginning? Each engineering discipline involved in the design problem can be represented by a black box. That is, each discipline requires a number of inputs and the discipline will do its own design calculations and as a result, it will provide 
a number of design outputs. For example, to size the power subsystem for a spacecraft, two of the main components to be considered are solar arrays and batteries. This assumes, of course, that we have chosen to explore the specific power subsystem architecture to meet our mission needs. Given a certain power requirement of the satellite instrumentation, as well as all other subsystems such as attitude determination and control, and having an idea of the concept of operations, for example, concerning the orbital configuration and the payload duty cycle, we would be able to calculate an optimal sizing for the solar arrays, that is, of the total surface area exposed, and optimal battery capacity, which is the electrical measure, so to speak, of the size of the battery. As a result of the design activities, we obtain a preliminary sizing of the volumes involved, as well as all masses involved in the subsystem. This information is passed then to the next design department for them to perform the work. This is why this approach is also known as over-the-fence approach. We literally pack all information of the design activity into a data package, and then our job is done and send it over. In this specific example, we can imagine that the department in charge of power and electrical systems will provide their sizing information to their mechanical engineering colleagues in order to fit the required power and electrical equipment into a suitable satellite structure. In this scenario, the structures and configuration engineer uses the information provided by her colleagues to define a physical allocation of the components within the satellite bus. By doing so, the engineers co consider a number of constraints, such as harness length that they want to minimize, thermal constraints, and mass balancing within the bus. In allocating batteries and solar arrays, they might be altering the inertial matrix of the spacecraft, which in turn will affect the output results of attitude determination and control, such as pa its power consumption, which has an obvious effect into the inputs of the power subsystem calculations that we had just performed a moment ago. In case of significant changes in this figure, this might imply that new information is fed back to the electrical engineers, who in turn will have to iterate their job to give us updated estimates of mass and volumes, for mechanical engineers then to reiterate on their task. As you might imagine, these cycles may take some time to converge, and may not converge at all in fact, if unfeasible paths are taken by the project team. In such cases, one would have to go one step back in the development and explore alternative technical solutions to realize the mission concept. This is a concrete example of what is known in engineering design theory as a feedback loop. A feedback loop is a backwards dependency between the design outputs of a discipline and its inputs that are due to complex interactions between the sizing relationships of the subsystems. The issue of feedback loops is well represented by this illustration, which is called an n-square diagram. Okay, in an n-squared diagram, each box represents a subsystem discipline involved, such as structure, thermal, propulsion, and so on. The incoming arrows to this box are design inputs that come either from overall system requirements or from calculations by other subsystems. The outgoing arrows are design outputs that are calculated by the discipline as the function of the inputs involved. The existence of feedback loops makes it such that a design needs to be iterated before converging to a feasible baseline. In pure waterfall development, one has to go through the entire chain of disciplines before cycling back and performing another iteration. And this is why, in essence, iterations are needed in the design of spacecraft systems. Iterations are good because they refine the quality of the design and they allow for optimizing target objective functions such as minimum wet mass or minimum life cycle cost. Once converged, the mission will start taking shape along with its key information. Examples of key results include the overall mass budget, the link budget, the power budget, the configuration of the spacecraft in stowed and operational modes, the selection of a launch vehicle baseline, first order estimates of development schedule and cost, and so on. On the other hand, iterations are bad. Why? Because they require time and therefore money to execute. Another important issue to be considered in this design problem is the flow of information across the organization and the means by which this information is collected, distributed and updated. In typical engineering organizations, information is collected in Word documents, Excel files, PowerPoint presentations, handwritten notes, Xerox copies, 
blueprints, CAD models, step files, and so on. A simple change, such as updating the size of the mass of a battery, may take weeks or months to propagate correctly through this entire documentation chain. Information may quickly become inconsistent across departments and across project documentation as design iterations evolve. In order to avoid this issue, systems engineering practice prescribes the establishment of a rigorous configuration control management system. Configuration control works, of course, if it is implemented properly, but it also induces time delays on the design. Our traditional design approaches are well proven to work, but they require time to execute. This approach works very well and in a very reliable manner for institutional missions with large budgets and long time scales. However, it starts becoming unsuited for highly competitive environments and accelerated development schedules. In summary, the issues with traditional waterfall over defense approaches are 1. Overall project speed, 2. Cost and time associated with design iterations, and 3. Consistency of design information across the departments of the organization. We have covered a lot of ground today. It is probably a good point now to take some time to reflect and share our professional experiences and to discuss. Share your comments and thoughts by posting them in the comment section below. Does your organization use waterfall type design processes? Did you experience some of the issues that I described here, such as painful iterations to reach convergence in defining a product baseline? Let us start a technical discussion. I'm very happy to engage with you guys. This is all for today. And in the next video, we're going to move a step forward and introduce concurrent conceptual design and compare it to waterfall design processes. Also in the next video, I will discuss how all of this relates to the new space industry and to startups. I hope those insights will be useful inspiration for you to innovate and be successful in the commercial market. Stay tuned and thank you very much for watching as always. Goodbye.